today's talk, uh, this or today's lecture, is on the structural features of the uh, Palouse Basin. Uh, we just mentioned last time that there's a lot of literature uh, over the Columbia River uh, Plateau, a lot of uh, documentation that uh, sets things as folds, uh, uh, faults, and possibly dikes uh, influence the uh, direction and the amount of water movement. So the Palouse Basin is not known as a highly structural area, but there are some structures that we'll talk about today and uh, talk about their possible influence. Remember, as you're looking at the diagram here, our old favorite, the central part of area, which we could call segment B, but basically it's the area between Moscow and Pullman, is in what I call one structural block in the fact that most of the fold flows, basalt flows, and the sediments are pretty close to being horizontal. So what we're going to do most of today's talk is going to focus over here, out here on what we might call segment C, beginning uh, about um, WSU number eight on WSU campus, the eastern side of Pullman. Beginning at that point, we start to have some features. Uh, we have this monocline here, possibly. We have a syncline right going up Grant Street. Uh, uh, well, uh, just a little bit east of Grand Street in, in Moscow. Then we have a nanocline on the western end of Pullman, and then a gentle slope going out to the landfill well. That slope has been documented. The anticline has been documented uh, quite well. So there are existing features. So we'll be talking about maybe how much influence they have or don't have on groundwater. So the uh, general topics will be on the structural blocks, what I call structural blocks. What we, a map of the upper part of the Grand Ron, in other words, the Grand Ron surface, in other words, uh, the surface of the lower aquifer rocks. We'll talk about uh, uh, the fold locations, the, We'll talk about also potential uh, fault and dikes, and we'll see if they, what we think about, uh, what I think about control on, uh, that they have on groundwater movement. So let's first of all, uh, take a little look at what I call structural blocks. Look at our entire area. <clears throat> Excuse me. We mentioned the evidence pretty strong at the Moscow Pullman Basin is a pretty large area. It's a horizontal block uh, going north to Palouse. We don't have much data on the Palouse area, but it's pretty clear that it's probably a horizontal block, just like uh, Moscow and, and Pullman Bay. We have the rocks to the east are relatively horizontal. As we move to the west of Palouse, we get into what I call uh, the Kofax block. Now that we have recently decided it doesn't belong in uh, our Palouse Basin, but uh, examining it and getting some details out of it uh, helps to understand the rest of the area. As we've talked about before, the drainages change as you get west of Palouse and they change as you get west of the Moscow Pullman Basin. So the Palouse River comes out of the Palouse City area and that makes sort of a right hand, right hand bend to the southwest. At one time, I've walked that entire uh, river and what is a very gently dipping uh, basalt flow. The Palouse River is on top of the same basalt flow, that whole seven miles from uh, Alberton down to Colfax. The subsurface or the drill logs show lots of variation in the lower aquifer 
which was the main reason that it was uh, considered not to be the same as the Moscow Pullman Basin. There's wells down into five and 600 feet, down into the Grand Run, right along the river, some of which are dry, some of which are good uh, uh, domestic wells, and then there's one set of springs that produces a lot of water. But basically, the difference is that this block, the intraflow zones are dipping to the southwest, and they're not well developed. Now we get down here to the Union Flat Creek area, which I have called segment C at times. So the change from the horizontal rocks in the Moscow Pullman Basin occurs right along the boundary with the uh, south fork of the Palouse, where everything is now going to the northwest at the surface. As we'll uh, point out, the groundwater flow is uh, flowing to overall, not specifically any one spot, but overall is flowing to the northwest. Uh, the intraflow contacts between aquifer units in this area are approximately 200 feet below those in the Moscow Pullman Basin. So that change begins to occur at Pullman. And just if you think about it, if they're 200 feet lower here, just four miles away uh, from Pullman, there has to be some kind of structural change between the Pullman area and Union Flat Creek. It, something has to happen. The basalts were once horizontal. They didn't flow uphill. So those aquifer units that are down 200 feet lower, something has to occur to explain that difference. Now, in terms of water movement, if you believe the rule of thumb, that in general, uh, uh, groundwater uh, follows the, is concentrated in the intraflow zones. So therefore, water moves downhill in those intraflow zones. So this dip to the southwest up here in Kofax would suggest that the water is moving uh, to the southwest down along the same direction that the Palouse River is going. We get down here to the Union Flat Creek area, and uh, there's been enough evidence uh, to uh, tell us that the water is being, is primarily, is primarily moving to the northwest, the same direction as the Snake River, the same direction as the early part of the Almoda Canyon, the same direction as Union Flat Creek, same direction as the South Fork of the Palouse. We do not have any deep producing wells in the Union Flat Creek. So we don't know precisely what the subsurface is like under there. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, as we proceed along because this is an important part of the Palouse Basin. The biggest question is, is this zone a barrier zone? Is it a restricted uh, area? Does the water flow through there evenly as it does in the Moscow Pullman Basin? The water levels of three observation wells there tell us that the water is connected in the lower aquifer to those in the Moscow Pullman aquifer. Connections, similar water levels mean they're connected. It does not mean they are connected. It doesn't tell you anything about the nature of that connection. So the big question, and still is a question, uh, is what are the connections like out here? Are they easily connected to the Pullman area or are they not? Okay, to talk about some of the structures, I have to take a second here and look at a little bit of a complicated map. Uh, it's a map that geologists would call a structural contour map on the upper surface of the Grand Ronde Basalt. Uh, you can think of it as a topographic map, a subsurface topographic map. In other words, what we've done here is removed all the thicknesses of the loss, the basalt, the sediments down to the top of the Grand Run and made a contour map uh, on that surface. And it, even though the uh, rocks, <clears throat> 
appear to be held relatively horizontal in the center, it's obviously that the rock, the upper Grand Ronde surface is not a flat surface clear across uh, segment A, segment B, and segment C. The brown areas are the highest elevation, the highest elevation out here in the, between Moscow and Pullman is about uh, 2,350 feet. If you go to the east, the yellows and the greens are at lower elevations. And to the east, that surface drops pretty steeply down into below the Moscow area. At one time, I thought, well, that must represent a dip slope or the same rock dipping down into Moscow and must be folded or something. Uh, that was one of my mistakes. It took me a couple of years and some questions about it to figure it out. That slope that you see on that, on that uh, structural contour map is actually not a real structural feature. If you, if you remember what we talked about in Moscow, the upper, the upper part of the Grand Ron, you hit the uh, N2 flow out here halfway between Moscow and Pullman. And then each flow as you go down into the Grand Ron, down into the lower aquifer, the top of the Grand Ron surface, the top of the upper, the lower aquifer is actually indicating that is produced is by the fact that the flows are thinning out, at least the R2 flows are thinning out as you go into to Moscow. So what you're showing on the structural contour map is that the uh, it's a slope produced by flows thinning out, not any kind of structural feature. In the central part of the area, in the area between Moscow and Poland, I show you that brown area. It shows sort of a subsurface mesa or a subsurface butte, it's pretty flat, pretty large area that's flat. Well, the, we know from our well data that the flows out there, the basalt flows, that the contacts are relatively flat. So the con structural contour map or the topographic map in that area is telling you what the structure is like beneath the uppermost Grand Run. Now we head over into uh, Pullman and we have this combination of a monocline, syncline, anticline, large slopes. So let's see how they fit into the thinking of a structural contour map. Now I've taken the cowers away here because I want to talk about, make sure we understand these slopes. So if we were a rhinoceros in Moscow 16 million years ago, after the last Grand Ronde flow came into the area, we would have had to walk up a pretty steep slope to get out of here onto this mesa and butte where there might be some uh, nice trees to chew on or some grass vegetation. Out there on top of that mesa though, if we continue west, the lines drop down again you have to, get, according to this interpretation, you have to get down into a low area, and then you got to climb over a high area to get out of there. You got to climb back up over a hill to get out, and then out to the west, you would drop down that 200 feet we talked about into the uh, Union Flat Creek area. Now, the Geologic mapping by Swanson way back in the 70s verified that there's a syncline heading to the Northwest. There is a downfold in that area and it's dropping to the Northwest. Geologists would call that plunging to the Northwest. Well, the documentation there, in other words, says that this structural contour map is in fact telling us what the structure is like in a subsurface. So we're gonna come back to maybe the two important areas. This hill here in Western Pullman is an anticline. It's been now documented as uh, 
a true anticline, not just from my work, but from other work, uh, uh, principally uh, Rick Conroy uh, doing some work for WSU and publishing a report to PBank that anticline it's an upfold, it's a small upfold, but it does have a long gentle slope, just like our cross section shows. So there's an anticline there. Now the corresponding syncline and a monocline to get up on the flat area in here does have a few questions. I have interpreted it as a syncline. It's the uh, east side of the anticline, uh, the banter well is where the lowest elevations in that syncline is. There is another possibility, Rick Conroy, uh, he believes the, right, that the banter well could be located in a down drop area with a fault on both sides. So this low area here, this sort of tight area, could be a down drop area. Uh, I believe it's still this, as you created these folds, there was the anticline. This is just a low limb, a tight limb going down um, and then coming back up. But in either case, all these structures do what? All these features on here point to the Northwest. So how do we know that for sure that uh, the anticline, let's look at the anticline. How do we know that's an anticline for sure? What data? do we have? So let's go um, down here and look one more time at the structural contour map. And then we're going to come down back to the detail. If you're interested in the details, this is uh, published by uh, the Idaho Geological uh, Survey 2018 under my name. It's also uh, posted on the uh, uh, PBAC webpage. So when I look at it, I see this low area over here in Moscow. Then I see the basalt's flat crossed here. I put in the red lines here, put on where the trace, where the folds are. And I interpret this syncline we just talked about going up through the banner well. Talked about a anticline going this high area west of Pullman been known for a long time. There's a high area there, and it's an anticline, and we get this syncline out here to the west. So let's just double check what we use. Are they wrinkles created by erosion, or are they wrinkles created by a fold? Why it is so important is if this these changes in elevation at the top of the Grand Ronde are indicative of the subsurface, and then we can help uh, model or think about the groundwater in the subsurface. So are they really features that indicate what the subsurface is like? So what I have coming up is we'll do a little cross section across the right through, basically east-west across the Pullman area, and then we're going to go to the northern part of the anticline and uh, look at a cross section that goes sort of northwest, but across that anticlinal feature. So once again, what we want to know are these folds illustrated here with the red. The arrows on these folds point to what we call plunge or slope. <clears throat> In other words, this anticline, this upfold, is dipping in space to the northwest, as I believe all the folds are dipping to the northwest. As I know, even here at the Banter Well, even if you want to interpret it as a uh, fault block, the elevations at the Banter Well are lower than any place along the edges of the Moscow Poland Basin. So back to this anticline. What's this anticline look like in space? Is it an anticline? So we do all some cross sections across here from data we have. The uh, first one is right here, going in Pullman from downtown uh, Pullman City, well, seven, which is on Grand Street to the west, to uh, northwest to the DOE landfill. And see what happens. We start up here with the city. Uh, City well uh, 
number seven, and we can plot the elevations there from using the salt chip chemistry, well recorded interflow contacts, and then follow that contact up to the northwest. In this case, right along the uh, uh, south fork of the Palouse to where the yard wells are located, to where the municipal building is at. And there, um, you can follow the outcrops. They're pretty well covered by grass and slumping and so forth, but you can follow the geology at the surface. And there's no doubt that the low, low flow shown here in green, excuse me, shown here in blue, rises from uh, about a little over 75 feet to the top of an outcrop exposed right along, right along the road, right next to the yard wells. The yard wells tell us that, and here's the key, because now we're down here in the Grand Ronde, we're down here in a lower aquifer. The yard wells show us that the contacts there also rise in the lower aquifer uh, units. So that's the key telling us that that uh, structural contour map, that topographic map, is actually telling us what the subsurface is like. Even though those lines are somewhat interpretive on that map, they do indicate, they uh, delineate this small upfold. From that point down, you can trace the contacts drop about 200 feet all the way to the DOE well. Another thing you might notice of interest is that the rows of flow uh, belongs to the same for, that belongs to the same formation as the low low flow, but it pinches the ground out against that hill, against that subsurface, that anticline. And that's of interest because if water moves down the interflow zones, there's a lot of potential there in those thin zones for water to move in above the contact or in that interflow zone. And uh, Moxley, 2011, a thesis at w, WSU has shown that the water is moving across the South Fork of the Palouse River into that contact zone. Uh, so it, using that rule of thumb that water should move downhill and should move into another rule of thumb. This is where the water is, uh, the salts are thin and fractured. The water can move uh, into those flows easily. So Moxley's work sort of verifies that the uh, those two rule of thumbs. Now this cross section, this elevation, let's look up here at the height, the top uh, of the uh, Grand Ronde, and look what happens as we go north. So this is just a planar view, sort of telling us what it looks like at that position. But is it what's it look like to north? down the axis, what we call the trace of the axis. And let's draw a cross section uh, across from the Banner Well, right along just, just south of Albion, just south of the quartz sites that make up Smooth Hill. And we see there, if we look at this elevation there, one we just looked at, that elevation there to the north uh, is over 100 feet less than it is in Pullman. So it's telling us that the anticline is doing what we call plunge, or it's sloping, it's down dropping to the northwest. Uh, so we can draw, I don't know how many cross sections you'd like me to draw, but we've drawn a lot of cross sections across that anticline, it's real. Rick Conroy doing detailed basalt chip chemistry. Whether it affects the groundwater movement is up to other pieces of data, but it's not a non-real real feature. It is there as well as the, uh, uh, what I call the Union Flat Creek Syncline to the west. So now, now we know the structures are there uh, and I should have pointed out, I, get carried away. Let's back up here just a second before we get started on the water approach. Let's a little look at uh, some other possibilities of things that might influence groundwater movement. Right below WSU8, where my cursor is now, 
Uh, there's an explosion on the highway on the Moscow Point Highway. There are some small dikes of the Saddle Mountains basalt. So if this cross section couldn't show all the detail, but they project to the northwest also. Uh, Rick Conroy has interpreted a possible fault here just uh, uh, east of WSU 7. So it, but it trends to the northwest. So let's don't forget there's a potential for faults and dikes down there. I'm going to focus primarily on the folds. So do these features, including the structural block that change direction of dip, what's some of the evidence for structural control on the groundwater movement? My overall thinking is that these folds and structures create a partial barrier to westward flow. And therefore, because of that barrier, and maybe even barriers out, the barriers out in the Union Flat Creek area, these barriers should be accommodated in any kind of model or any kind of thinking to our water, overall water system. So let's look at the uh, artesian water data first. And I think that's quite interesting to me. Whoops, went too fast here on my uh, going. Let's look at the artesian water first. <clears throat> For those that don't know uh, about this, in the early, late 1800s, early uh, 1900s, Pullman depended on wells that had, uh, that had artesian flow. Those, uh, uh, the first, early most flow of wells uh, projected 65 feet in the air, and one of them was um, measured as being producing uh, over 2,000 gallons a minute. So uh, if you take the top of this elevation, this becomes curious. Top of that elevation is uh, 2,365 feet, which is the relatively near the base and middle of the low, low flow as you go from Pullman to Moscow. If you go just a little bit west, <coughs> excuse me, where our cross-section was to the municipal buildings, the elevation at the bottom of the low, low flow is about 2,360 to 2,365 feet. So this tells me, or at least my interpretation is, that here we have an early well. By the way, the well is coming out of uh, sands in the vantage, uh, the upper part of the fractured, uh, uppermost surface of the Grand Ron, and some fractures out of the uh, bottom of the low, low flow. So these are lower water, le lower aquifer levels. And in my mind, something is keeping that water from moving to the west. If you are going to move the water west through nice interflow contacts without any structure, or even a, just a straight slope that's sloping to the west, the water would have drained out of the Moscow Pullman basin. We know that the water is moving from Moscow to Pullman, uh, from Moscow Mountain to Pullman, probably moving from the Blue City area. It's going out through Pullman. Why did we have artesian water? Why didn't it just run away? Well, in my mind, it's being held back by something. Something is holding back. When we first drilled up, when they first drilled these wells, they hit a con very confined layer. Uh, the source, the elevation of that, uh, those well, of those uh, water towers, so to speak, of those top of those wells. That's been identified as being not just my estimate from this picture, but from other uh, reports at the top of those were about 2,365 feet. And my, and to me, that's evidence of something's holding that water back. It should have gone out to the west. Uh, and so that's a piece of evidence that the something was holding it back way back when we first uh, began pumping uh, from that lower aquifer. 
Then we look at some other sources. Well, does the structure, can, do we have any proof that the structure is controlling groundwater movement in other areas? Out here in the Union Flat Creek area, we know that the syncline dips to the northwest. We know that we're on another structural block that's dipping to the northwest. We know that we have dikes in the system that go to the northwest. We have dikes, by the way, that are projected in uh, from, from to the south. Don Swanson in the uh, early, uh, late uh, 1970s projected uh, potential for N2 dikes into this area. We've now identified some of those dikes along the Snake River. We know that this water must be moving to the Northwest because it can be documented that it's flowing away from the uh, uh, Snake River. Uh, going back as far as uh, Clancy, uh, excuse me, Walters and Clancy in 1969, they reported that there were that the shallow wells out here along the Snake River were pretty much dry and the water was moving to the Northwest. Uh, Lawrence uh, Hemgardner in 1994 talks about wells along the edges here, deep wells being dry, both, uh, well, we'll back up to, uh, to uh, Waters and Clancy. He indicated if you're going to get a good well, you're going to have to drill down below the level of the Snake River. What? Uh, 1,800 feet down to the Snake River. So the data showed for Barker on water levels that water's moving away from that from that area into uh, the uh, Union Flat Creek area. So pretty good proof that water's moving in the subsurface the same way that the streams are flowing. And that was, of course, part of the evidence, which I've mentioned many times, the streams flow to the Northwest and the groundwater flows to the Northwest. Some other circumstantial evidence, which is interesting. Uh, there was a lot of pump test reports, studies done around uh, 2010, 2011, three master theses at the University of Idaho. Previous to that, there were numerous uh, uh, pump tests. Those all, all of the reports indicate that, boy, the lower aquifer is really compartmentalized. So, and that seems to be uh, something that stood the test of time. Uh, the interesting part, once again, is that the resources are compartmentalized, but the water levels are relatively similar. So we have a system in which something is producing compartmentalization. Uh, there are many reasons for that. So Negi uh, talks about maybe the pinch outs in the east over in Moscow uh, are causing some compartmentalization. Uh, Eddie and uh, UI thesis in 2002 uh, talks about the faults in the folds. The structural features could be causing that compartmentalization. And once again, if you're not sure what we mean by compartmentalization, that means even though you can drill down into the Grand Run, drill down into the lower aquifer and get a good well almost anywhere, it's not a new resource because they're all interconnected. But interesting enough, when you run pump tests, uh, you find out that on a short-term basis, wells right next to your well may not be affected by the pumping. And yet the data might show a well three miles away be heavily, strongly affected by that pumping. So that's sort of what we mean by compartmentalization. It's not a big lake down there. It's not interconnected in every direction from one place to another. It is very compartmentalized. And that the structural features in the subsurface, which sure explain some of that compartmentalization. Uh, Pullman City 8 is very interesting. 
that well was drilled in about 2009, I believe. Uh, the very accurate pump test done at that well. Pullman uh, 8 is on the east side of the anticline, uh, Pullman anticline. Um, it's about at the head of the syncline that extends from there to Bannon Well. They noted that at 3,200 feet, there was a sharp change. And that change in the collecting the pump data was interpreted to be a very a relatively barrier somewhere 3,200 feet from the well. The reason I say it's interesting, if you go 3,200 feet from that well, you're right in dead center of what we project the center of the, the uh, pull and anticline. The centers of the anticlines, centers of any fold, have the highest potential for being a barrier because the fractures get compressed uh, and because of the folding. And so just interesting about that coincidence. The problem with that as being circumstantial, rather actual evidence, is that you don't, when they, they could calculate the 3,200 feet, but they couldn't calculate, you don't know what direction it is. Maybe there's a barrier to the south, maybe there's a barrier to the north, whatever. So you're really not positive where that barrier is. It's just circumstantial evidence for what I am proposing. Then we look at work by Barker. Barker did a one-dimensional computer model in the late 70s, 1979 is when it was published. He suggested there was a barrier west of Pullman. Uh, he uh, makes the illustration here to show his approximate location of a barrier zone. Well, this is the same zone I've been talking about. We got to drop 200 feet in elevation or interflow contact. We got a syncline going up the Union Flat Creek. We've got an intercline between there and there. We got other circumstantial evidence. We got uh, dikes heading through this area. Uh, we got uh, no deep wells. We got geophysics suggesting drill uh, done, I think, about eight years later suggesting that there is a uh, some high area southwest of Pullman. Uh, they suggested not indicated that maybe that high area was a volcanic neck. Uh, I've looked at an outcrop over on uh, Amoda grade and uh, identified earlier by Don Swanson. Uh, it uh, tells you you're near a vent area, verifying that there are nearby <coughs> dikes in the subsurface. So the other thing I would just mention, another circumstantial piece of evidence, when you look at nearby wells up in the Colfax area, add one well down in Genesee, the intraflow zones in them are not well connected from uh, well to well. So I would think we're going way back and thinking about how these basalt flows were in place. Remember they were, most of them the Grand Ron flows, our lower aquifer rocks, are were moving by Moscow and Pullman, bouncing off of the basement rocks, the granites, did the same thing over in Colfax, the flows were moving, some of those moving from north to south. There was a lot of mixing and that's been identified in the literature that there's a lot a lot of mixing of the N2 flows. So not consistent inner flow zones. And I think that is that sort of uh, talking out of the box. Uh, that may not be proven, but I think about the flows coming in across Pullman into the Moscow area. When they get into the Moscow area, because they're the ones that get in there are running out of steam and they kind of fan out. There's not they don't reach, in most cases, don't reach the basement rocks. So they can, they get ponded in there. Nice horizontal, uh, nice steady cooling in the interflow zones. Do, interflow zones are best produced 
in areas where the basalts are somewhat stagnant when they're cooling and not confined uh, in most around all the edges. So I just think that's all these things are happening out here in this barrier zone. And another interesting thing about Barker's work, uh, it's old time data and it's an old time model, model type to use and some hydrologists laugh at it. Another thing I noticed when you look at his reports, what you see is Northwest features. There's no doubt about to me that the Northwest features that I talked about in geology are somewhat controlling the Northwest features that Barker reported. For example, even ones that are not particularly related to the lower aquifer. He did a, uh, a uh, water level map, so to speak, of elevations from uh, Moscow out to the west. And there's not a particularly even match. Remember, the, this is from the upper aquifer water levels in 1974. Remember that the upper aquifer is really compartmentalized and it does not contain water levels at the same throughout. Yet look at this Northwest structure from Pullman to Albion, this trough in the water levels. If you look through his report, he just flipped the maps. He does lots of maps, some on the uh, uh, trend of the, sh of the overburden uh, with respect to the lower aquifer. You're gonna see again and again, a Northwest structure. He, will also show down here in the Union Flat Creek area south of us, southwest of us, he'll show lines that showing water moving away, water level data moving away from the Snake River into this, uh, the uh, Union Flat Creek area and into this trough, which he has over here, illustrated way back uh, from 1974 data. Anyways, maybe circumstantial uh, evidence uh, but I think uh, uh, you're starting to see uh, pieces and parts that add up to, there seems to me no doubt that these structures are changing the movements of the groundwater flow and that they uh, are likely to be barriers. So let's take a look back to the structures and take a little conclusions. Uh, here's a map I put together, uh, making, putting the structural features that we know and groundwater movements that we know, and some of it's a little speculation. But uh, black lines indicate the presence of mapped or identified uh, folds. Remember, we're going to add into that the potential of dikes that head northwest and potential of faults which head northwest not potential dikes, there are dikes out there that tend to the Northwest. Get down here to the Snake River. There's an anticline along the edge of the Snake River and it's causing water to move temporarily to the Northeast until it runs in to the uh, overall structural Northwest dipping block causing the long blue line here indicating the direction of groundwater movement. We look here to Colfax and this is the outsider area, but it's, I think it's interesting. Uh, there appears to be some kind of monoclinal axis away from the basement rocks. And we know that the, the uh, geology tells us that the uh, uh, groundwater or the rocks are dipping to the Southwest. So the water is probably moving to the Southwest controlled by that structural block. We go into Moscow Pullman area. Uh, we have enough data. We'll be talking about that uh, when we talk about recharge, that water is moving from Moscow Mountain and from the Moscow area. All of that can be traced to, uh, based on analytical data, not on my speculation that the water is moving towards Pullman. I think when it gets to Pullman, that then it's deflected and that these structures are also creating either a partial barrier or a whole barrier. So how does the water get out of the Moscow Pullman Basin if it's being held back? Well, it's moved north to Albion. 
there's about a three the nine square mile area there around Albion, just east of Albion, where the interflow contacts are uh, um, way below those in Pullman, way below those in the Moscow area, and why I say way below, 100 feet below. So water moves downhill. So I think that area is the area that's forcing the water to move along these structures that's heading towards these low, towards a sink. And then you gotta think about these folds. These folds are doing what in space? They are dropping in elevation. They are plunging to the Northwest. So I think the water is being forced to there. And then it's going around those nose of that Albion area in order to get out here into the Union Flat Creek area and have the same uh, water levels. The same water levels, once again, mean that they're connected, but it doesn't mean, doesn't tell you anything about the nature of the connection. I propose that all these systems are slowing the water down, slowing the connections are not that good. They're barriers or partial barriers. And just like uh, Barker proposed that his proposed barrier zone, this whole area here has very a lot of features that can be as a collective groups, faults, folds, dikes, volcanic necks, plunging folds to the northwest. All of these are going to be slowing that water down. And that's the barrier area. Now there's going to be small areas where it's not always flowing northwest along the Pullman anticline, down the slopes of the anticline, and a couple places on topographic maps you can find uh, stream drainages directly at right angles to the Union Flat Creek on the west side of the anticline. We talked about Moxley pointing to the fact that there's water moving across the south fork of the Palouse and it's moving really to the southwest. So they're moving in the local area, moving to the southwest, getting into the overall northwest trend of water movements. So we'll talk a little more about the barrier and the potential barriers down the, down the road, um, probably the last, the last lecture. But I think any modeler, any person considering our system has to realize or accommodate First of all, the segments in Moscow are mostly aquifers. Sediment A is mostly uh, sediments. Sediment B, the rocks are horizontal. The blow is hitting barriers in Pullman and hitting barriers here out in Union Flat Creek. One last area to cover before I finish. The Palouse area can be shown and documented to be joining or be joined in the lower aquifer system with the Moscow Pullman Basin. I'm not exactly sure whether the water is flowing from Palouse or from uh, uh, the Moscow Pullman Basin in the Palouse. This could be another area. I'm pretty sure it goes across there. This is one of those areas that we'll talk about the next time. It could be a recharge area. Remember, they have similar water levels in the city of Palouse as they do in the Butte Gap, well, as they do in the Moscow area. So possibly, uh, uh, well, definitely they're connected, just don't quite know which way the water is moving. It could be moving both ways. So, okay, next time the talk will be uh, on recharge, uh, which is about 40, 45 minutes uh, along. And that will continue to add pieces and parts to how our aquifer system works. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.